right, everybody. I won't take any more of Dr. Narayan Singh's time. I would like to welcome you back to another Innovate Seminar series uh, for May. And thank you all for logging on. Um, if you've never logged on before, Innovate Seminar is a series that we started kind of during the pandemic to sort of highlight our members. And this is a collaboration with the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics at UC Santa Barbara. And today I am honored to introduce our speaker, Dr. V in the building. Dr. V is honestly an amazing human, if I could just speak to that for a second uh, before I give my formal intro. Honestly, when I met, it was during COVID and it was virtually, but I could feel the connection of being in person with him just from the energy that he gives off and the kind, the kindness that he has and the support that he's given to our mentoring program. So, you know, meeting him in person, it was almost like we had known each other and we'd met before. Uh, very, very kind soul. So just to, you know, big him up and talk about what he actually does, he is a physicist, okay? He is a, a NSPP member, and he utilizes computer programming and mathematics to study the physics of weather, climate, and climate change. He completed his bachelor's and PhD at the City University of New York, CUNY. And he's currently a postdoc researcher at the Cooperative Institute between Princeton University and NOAA Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. He is a born and raised New Yorkers whose parents immigrated from the island of Trinidad. He has very strong passions towards diversity, equity, and inclusion within STEM spaces. And he currently serves as the Director of Community Outreach for the Harlem Gallery of Science and he is a founding member of our partnership um, mentoring program with the Harlem Gallery of Science, which serves adolescents in the Harlem, New York City area. Uh, and I could say as part of that program, it has really been a life-changing experience to come up out of that program. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. V, uh, ready when you are. All right, great. Oh, man, I'm a little bit nervous. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, first of all, thank you, Elon, for the amazing introduction. And thank you all for this incredible honor to be giving this seminar. As Elon said, my name is V. And today I'll be talking to you about weather and climate science from the perspective of a physicist. Um, before I jump too deep into it, though, I just want to big up and shout out the National Society of Black Physicists. First of all, for hosting this event, but second of all, for just being so great. I began working with you all a couple of years ago to start this mentoring program, and it's really been nothing but good vibes and family and community, and it was really the first time I was able to interact with physicists that I could actually identify with. So just want to shout out NSBP. If you're not part of NSBP, you should definitely join. You should definitely support. You don't necessarily have to be a member of the African diaspora as well. You can also be an ally. So definitely shout out NSBP and support them as much as I can. Um, so here's some shots from various events. You might know some of these people in here. Anyway, so here's a little agenda of what to expect. First, I'll talk a little bit about my journey being a physicist and then getting into climate science. And then we'll talk a bit about the fluid atmosphere, some fluid dynamics aspects, then focus in on a, a more specific topic, anti-cyclones in the atmosphere. And then here's some perspectives from the director of the lab that I work in. So let's get to it. All right. I like to start from the beginning. So this is uh, my grandmother and her name was Dora and she lived in Trinidad. And she uh, originally was a cane cutter. And although she didn't get a uh, high school education or anything like that, somehow she became a senator in Trinidadian parliament. And um, she was one of the first women to serve in the halls of parliament. And one thing about her is she didn't take anybody's crap. You know, no one can intimidate her. And I feel like that rubbed off on me. She eventually saved up her coins and with my parents, my mom, my dad, my aunties, my uncles, my brother, my sister, they all moved to the Bronx where I was born. 
here's uh, my grandmother in the park in the Bronx uh, playing some cricket. And um, we, I was born in the Bronx. And uh, beginning parts of my life, we lived over there. And it was cool being around family and all that all the time. And then we moved upstate to upstate New York, which was very beautiful in terms of nature. It also um, had some good opportunities in terms of education. I was able to take college courses and all that kind of stuff. So that was very helpful growing up, good teachers and all that. But the thing is, when I was uh, upstate, I got a little too caught up with my friends and didn't really take school too seriously. So although you know I was pretty good at math and stuff like that, I was more interested in hanging out with my friends. And when I went to college, uh, it, dis it didn't get any better. So I went to college. I still just wanted to have fun and all that. And you can see that when I first started off in college, I wasn't a very good student. So first time I took physics, I actually failed it. And I had to withdraw from the course. And now I got a whole PhD. So, you know, you go through different stuff in life and then you overcome those challenges and hopefully eventually become successful and, and proud of yourself. So, um, yeah, a bunch of life stuff happened to me. I figured my stuff out. I started you know, working harder, studying more, going to a tutoring center, going to office hours. Also started volunteering with the physics club at my school at City College of New York, um, which is a school in Harlem, and um, getting some leadership experience. I also worked in a lab, and that was really fun. It's like a lab with absolutely no relation to what I do now, but... Uh, this is me making some quantum dot solar cells. So you used to sit there and make the quantum dots and then turn them into solar cells. But I found working in an optics lab to be very interesting because I, I liked all the different things you could do with the wavelengths of light. The way you can put filters and you pick out red light and green light and the way the light interacts with matter and excites different aspects of it. You know, you can reflect light. You, you have your beams going different directions. So, you know, that aspect of waves in general was uh, very exciting to me and eventually helped me build the confidence that hmm, maybe I could really become a physicist. Maybe this isn't, you know, just someone who fails physics and that's it. Maybe I can I can live my dream. So I applied to a physics program, PhD program, a bunch of them, actually. I got into one of them and that was at, you know, the school that I did my undergrad at. So um, that's what I was left with. And I was like, OK, cool. I'm going to just make the most out of any situation. I also didn't do that good on the GRE, so I didn't get to go to the schools that I wanted to, but it's okay. It worked out for me. Here is um, first year PhD. And let me tell you, wow, it was so, so difficult. Here's my friend Mandeep. He's from India. And I'll be working here on complex analysis branch cuts. And I'm telling him, like, dude, like, you, this stuff is so hard. Like, how do you understand this? And he's like, you kidding me? I did this in high school. And I'm like, wow, yeah, American education system. So with the help of friends like him and then others and, you know, working really hard, I was able to get through it. I did pretty well in my classes, passed my qualifying exam. And I originally went to grad school because I wanted to do astrophysics. It was always what I was interested in growing up and, you know, studying neutron stars and stuff like that. But none of the astrophysics professors had funding to take me or maybe, you know, they didn't want me. I don't know. But, you know, I was like, OK, I can't do my plan A. So I try to do something practical. I want to learn some coding skills because that's going to help me um, get a job afterwards that will, you know, probably pay well. So I just try to be practical with the science I do. Um, and then eventually, serendipitously, maybe it led me to NOAA. So NOAA, if you don't know what NOAA is, I didn't know what NOAA was until they started paying my bills, to be honest. But NOAA is like NASA, but instead of looking out into the universe, NOAA is looking down into the Earth, looking at the ocean, the atmosphere, fisheries, so on and so forth, really, you know, Earth science aspects. And they have these programs where they fund students. So I was like, okay, it's a good opportunity. I get funding. They give me a little internship, and um, I get to go to conferences and all that. So I was like, all right, let me just do this because I know it'll it'll help me out. And yeah, I guess I'm very lucky because everything I was doing just turned out to be very, very interesting to me. I started studying, you know, atmospheric science, and I realized that this is just physics. It's just in an atmospheric science department, but it's really just like another physics class. And it also put me in touch with 
something called a cooperative institute at Princeton University and um, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. And if you don't know what um, GFDL is, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, it's yeah one of the top labs in this field. You know, some may say that even invented the field. So, you know, Nobel Prize winners and all that. So, you know, definitely I got to shout out NOAA as a gateway because I had no intention ever in my life to be working in atmospheric science, working in weather and climate. But it worked out for me. I think a lot of it had to do with the topics are genuinely interesting and it's physics at the end of the day. But also at the same time, people that were very nice to me and encouraging. So definitely try to check out NOAA as a gateway if you're a student interested or a postdoc interested in getting into this field. There's the Cooperative Science Centers, which I went to one of those. That's the one at City College. There's also some at Howard and Hampton and places like that. There's cooperative institutions, which are a bit more competitive, but also great opportunities. And then you look out on NOAA's website for internships and fellowships. So I put a QR code, you can scan that. It brings you to a Google Drive that has a bunch of documents you can check out with uh, different opportunities for students and postdocs. It even has some tips in there for how to, how to have a good um, application. And definitely if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. So that's a bit about my story and hopefully it can inspire you a little bit, but uh, let's talk about science now while we're all here. All right, so let's go with the basics. Now we all know what weather is, right? Weather is what you get day in and day out. It's if it's sunny, if it's cloudy, if it's rainy, or if you're gonna wear your Jordans, if you're gonna wear your Ugg boots, if you're gonna wear your open toes, whatever, whatever it is. And we rely a lot on weather forecasts. So we go on our phone in the morning and check what the weather is going to be like, of course. And when the weather systems are very energetic, they can lead to weather hazards. So I live in the Bronx and right next to my house is this highway. And uh, maybe last year, or the year before, there was this big hurricane that passed through and literally turned the highway into a river. It was really crazy to see. Now, thinking on different time scales, Let's think about climate. So climate is the average weather now, the average weather that you'd expect in a region. So for example, in places like Seattle, it's known to be very rainy. And places like Las Vegas, it's known to be hot and dry. These are the long-term features of the atmosphere and the climate can change over time. When we have Earth's energy budget, we can take a look at the energy balance and when we add things like uh, greenhouse gases that trap the, the energy and the heat, the climate can change over time. So here's just a quick snapshot of what that could look like in some data. So I did this project with some eighth graders in Harlem where we looked at the temperature in Central Park and we plotted that versus um, the years that it was available. So you can see from the you know 1800s till now, there's this, this visible trend in the temperature in New York City. So climate change is very real. Now, all of this stuff doesn't just happen by coincidence. And the beauty of it, the beauty of physics is that we can use physics and the mathematics to really describe what's going on around us. Physics can be used to understand and predict weather and climate. This is the field known as geophysical fluid dynamics. And of course, like any good physics field, you have these crazy looking equations. You have your Newton's law, for example, your conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, mass, uh, water, and then of course your equation of state. And um, you know, there's just a bunch of symbols up here, so it's probably really confusing, but you see that these are vector equations and there's a lot going on. Luckily for us though, we have computers and we can't solve these by hand actually, but the computer can, the computer can solve it for us. So that's what we do. We, we go into the computer and we say, okay, let's take the atmosphere. Let's break the atmosphere down into these little tiny cubes. And then in each one of those little tiny cubes, let's tell it to solve these equations for us. We also have to account for the lithosphere. So like the volcanoes, what the ocean is doing, what the ice sheets are doing, the vegetation, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, that's what we're doing. We're going into a computer and we're saying, solve these physics equations. And guess what? When you do that, you can do remarkable things. 
one of the remarkable things you can do is predict the weather. So this is exactly what weather forecast models are doing. That's how you know what the weather is going to be like tomorrow or the day after or the day after that. It's actually pretty remarkable. And sometimes you can get mad, like, you know, why can't we know the weather a week from now? It's crazy that we even know the weather a day from now, because look at these equations that we're solving using a computer. We can also take these models now and increase the greenhouse gases and then run it 100 years in the future and see what the climate will be like. We could even take it and run it backwards, you know, and see what the dinosaurs experienced if we wanted to. There's a lot of cool things that we can do with these weather models, and I really enjoy it. It's almost like playing a video game. Now, from a phenomenological point of view, sometimes as scientists, it's cool to just look at stuff, just observe, and really just think about how things are, are cool to us and interesting. So here what you can see is about 5,000 meters up in the atmosphere, what the flow looks like. So this is literally how the atmosphere is moving around. And you can see in general, the flow is kind of following along from west to east, and that's the same direction that the Earth is rotating. Um, the colors represent the temperature, but you don't have to get too caught up in that. It's almost mesmerizing, almost hypnotizing. So let's look at some certain features of the atmosphere. And like I said, these things don't just happen by coincidence. So here you can see a region where the flow is fastest. And this is known as the jet stream maximum. So this is why when you're taking a plane, you know, back from California to New York, it's quicker than going the other way. We also see that there's kind of a waviness to the flow. That's also not by coincidence. You'll also probably notice that there's some swirls going on in here. It's almost like someone was making a tasty iced tea or, or Kool-Aid or something. So you see these anti-cyclones when the swirls are going clockwise, those are known as anti-cyclones, high pressure systems. So all of these things are very fascinating to me. Um, this is just one very small aspect of atmospheric science. This is called mid-latitude dynamics. And I want to dig into that a bit more. So as any good physicist, we'll probably look at some math, too. It's not all about looking at nice animations. Math is, is important. And one thing that fascinates me is waves in the atmosphere. So in the atmosphere, we have something called PV. PV stands for potential vorticity, potential vorticity. And you can think of it as basically the swirliness in the atmosphere. You know, you have these vortices and that is conserved. It's almost like an angular momentum, but for a fluid. You have to consider some other things like the planetary rotation and the density. But in general, you're really focused on the, the vorticity, the spinniness. So it turns out that vorticity is actually conserved and we can write vorticity in terms of a form of Laplace's equation. So we have something called a stream function, which is related to the height of the atmosphere. And when we take the Laplacian of the stream function, we can get this vorticity. And vorticity is conserved. So for example, if you have a, a vortex that's in a at, part of the atmosphere that is not that is short, and you bring it to a part of the atmosphere that is tall, it'll begin to spin faster because it has to conserve. So conservation of quasi-geostrophic potential vorticity in this case looks something like this. These are probably just a bunch of confusing symbols, but um, this is just to show you a simplification of some of the crazier equations I showed you before. And it turns out that we can then linearize these equations so we're going to write all the stream function components, all the wind components, as some average, some mean state, plus a small perturbation. And then we linearize these equations. We want to just keep linear things in terms of the perturbation. That's these primes you see here. And probably, you know, you got to take a whole semester to fully appreciate and understand this of geophysical fluid dynamics. But... The key takeaway is that you can linearize these equations and simplify them, and you actually get wave solutions to the conservation of potential vorticity. And we saw that. We just saw that in the snapshot of the atmosphere, these waves.
You can then take these wave solutions, plug them back into your equation. You can get dispersion relationships relating the frequency to the wave number. You can take it a step further. You can get the phase velocity of waves in the atmosphere. You can get the group velocity. You can even play around with it. You can find conditions that, depending on the wave number for, for certain wave number waves, you can get waves that are actually still, that sit in the atmosphere and give you heat waves, for example. So it's actually kind of crazy to think about. So in this next part, I just give you an example of, you know, decomposing the atmosphere into different wave frequencies. Here is that geopotential height that I was talking about earlier, the height of the atmosphere. And again, the flow in the atmosphere follows along the contour. So it moves right where you see uh, the differences in color. Now, this is just a, a snapshot of the atmosphere on a given day. And we, this is something called the full field, the raw field. But we can then decompose this field into different frequencies. So I can do a 60-day low-pass filter field, for example. And this is what's known as my background state. That was my bar that I was showing you in the equation before. And then there's other frequencies I can look at, 30 to 60-day type of periods. And you get just bit these big kind of wave numbers. Um, and then you can go to higher frequencies, so 10 to 30 day and then 10 day high pass filtered fields. And really the weather that we experience, the climate that we experience is the interaction of waves of all different kinds of frequencies, as well as, you know, a bunch of other stuff going on as well. So in particular, I'm really interested in, in these waves on these time scales, 10 to 60 day time scales, because they can really give us some messed up weather patterns. So the next thing I want to show you is something called an atmospheric block. And this has to do with when you have those, those large waves and they sit over a region and give you persistent type of weather. So in this, um, this kind of animation, what you'll see is this atmospheric block. It's right here in the dotted contours. And then also I have the geopotential height. So remember, um, the flow in the atmosphere follows along these contours and it gives you a sense of what the winds are doing. You'll also see some arrows with some colors, and what that is showing is the wave energy that's entering into the block to help sustain it. So this will just give you an idea of, of seeing how the, the waves interact in, in real time. So as the block is amplifying, as it's increasing in strength, you see wave momentum coming in, then it starts to decay and wave momentum comes out, and then it, uh, amplifies again before it dies off. So, as you can see, atmosphere has a lot of cool physics going on that maybe you didn't even realize. I didn't realize this until I got into it. So let's come back to this topic of atmospheric blocking. Atmospheric blocks, to be more concise, are high-pressure systems. They're anti-cyclones. So going back to these um, waves that I was showing you, anticyclones are represented by um, positive heights. So here's an anticyclone. Here's a cyclone. Cyclone is low pressure. So these are anticyclones. They're large. They're quasi-stationary, so they don't move around a lot. And they're persistent, so they can last up to several weeks. They can lead to heat waves. They can lead to cold spells. They can also steer storms. So Hurricane Sandy was a really devastating example of that. So just to get a sense of the type of weather that you'd expect when you have an atmospheric block, I'll just show you really quickly. Here, basically, so here's Greenland. Here's the United States in this, in this map on the left. When you have an atmospheric block, I made something called a composite. So every time there's an atmospheric block in this region, in this box, I average together what the temperature looks like. So the block is represented by the big ridge in the height field. And you can see that when you have a block there, you have enhanced temperatures. And in particular over Greenland, they can really help to melt the ice. You also have blocks that affect the precipitation. So here on the right, you see that within the block, within the ridge, there is suppressed precipitation, so a reduction in precipitation. And then upstream of the block, there's an enhancement of precipitation. So that's this red here. So you can see it really acts to steer the rain away. 
Now, there's a lot of problems when it comes to blocking. There's problems with the physics of blocking. We don't really have a really good understanding of how they're generated, what factors contribute, what makes more of them, what makes less, but also how strongly coupled are blocks to extreme weather events, both in current climates and also in future climates. And then how does this change? How does blocking change in future climates in general? And why? What's the physical mechanism motivating these changes? So I don't have time to show you all of my work, but I'll show you maybe just one cool example um, as we go through it. But in this question, I was really thinking about, you know, why do blocks occur where they do? And why are there more blocks in the Northern Hemisphere? So what these maps are showing you is um, where blocks um, are most frequent. So here in the Northern Hemisphere on the right, Here's the United States. This is a, a stereographic map. So this is like if you were looking down from the North Pole. Um, so we see that blocks mostly occur right here off the coast of Greenland, about 12% of the time, and right here off the coast of Alaska, about 10% of the time. It doesn't you know, occur much anywhere else, but really concentrated in these two regions. And in South America, we see blocking mostly occurs right next to the tip of South America. So in this work, I wanted to kind of figure out why that is. And when I try to sound cool about the work that I do, I say that I get to build planets. It's almost like a video game. I can change these climate models to whatever kind of planet that I want and watch the weather evolve. So what we did here is we created something called an aqua planet. It was an Earth, basically, but we take off all the land and just leave an ocean bottom, a slab ocean on the bottom. And then we started adding in mountains and looking at when we change the height of the mountains, how does that change the climate? How does that change the blocking? And, and see how that relates to real life. So this paper came out a few years ago. You can check it out if you want. And here's a schematic of what the mountains look like. Kind of looks like a tasty avocado or something. Now, let's look at some of the results. So on the bottom now, what you're seeing here is the blocking climatology. Um, so how frequent we get blocks in different regions in the aqua planet. And you see that it's not anchored to any two particular places like it is in real life. However, when we add in mountains, we start seeing that the blocks become anchored in a certain place. So here's um, a good example of the 1,000 meter mountain. And when you put the mountain in there, you actually induce something called a stationary wave. So just like when you have a rock in a stream and it deflects how the stream flows, mountains do that to the atmosphere. So when you put in this mountain, it creates a region that's conducive to blocking. And then of course, when you raise the height of the mountain, you get stronger and stronger stationary waves and more and more blocking. So I have a lot more work that I could show you, but I don't wanna take up the whole time. So. Just to give you an idea of the kind of work that we do here, it's you know understanding weather, understanding the climate. Um, we can also do things like instead of changing the mountains, we can change the sea surface temperatures, so how warm the ocean is, and look at how the blocking evolves and try to understand how that affects climate change. Um, but with that being said, I'll, uh, I'll skip through this part just to save time. If anybody has questions, we can ask it at the end. But I'll leave up my conclusion slide and you can get a sense of some of the takeaways from this. Um, you can see my contact information is over there too, so definitely feel free to reach out to me anytime. And I'll just give you a second to digest this before we transition into the next part of the talk. So I know we went through that very quickly and it's probably very confusing. So. Definitely, I'm happy to stay at the end of the talk to, to clear up any questions people might have. But now I'll uh, maybe transition to the next part of the presentation. And I'll start by maybe giving a story. So this next person, um, I remember, so like I was saying, you know, the institution I work at is one of the top in the field. And I feel very proud of that because I've had a, you know, very rough life, you know, a lot of ups and downs to get here. And when I first gave a talk during my PhD um, at this institution, I felt very nervous. I was like, I'm not as smart as these people. Like, they're not going to care about me. Like, you know, they don't have to take me seriously. 
And then a bunch of, you know, people signed up to have a meeting with me. Then I go into one of these meetings and I see in this meeting, there's this um, Indian guy in there and I'm talking to him and I'm like, wow, this guy, you know, kind of reminds me of one of my uncles. He got a bald head and everything, same name, all that. And first thing he wants to do is talk to me about cricket. If you don't know what cricket is, cricket is, it's a sport in the Caribbean that's very popular. He wanted to talk to me about food, you know, who I am as a person. And eventually the conversation came to my research and he was very interested, very encouraging. And then I go and look up who this person is after my meeting and I'm like, oh wow, it's the director of the lab. And it wasn't only that instance that, you know, he was nice to me, but we kept going, Dr. Ram, him and I kept in touch and he was always very nice, very encouraging. And then I was like, maybe it'd be good to invite him to come to this talk. So a few weeks ago, you know, I go and look up because I don't really know what he studies. I didn't know what he studied. And I go look up his Google Scholar and I see he's got 62,000 citations on there. And I'm like, wow, because you would never even know because he's such, just such a nice down to earth guy. And the point of me saying all this is that I think if we really want to, you know, help people to make STEM a more diverse place, physics a more diverse place. It takes very, very accomplished people to take the time out of their day to encourage you and to recognize you and bring them in. And that's what Dr. Ram really did for me, you know, take the time to encourage me and teach me how to be a scientist and, 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 and be nice to me. So with that being said, um, I'll proudly introduce Dr. Ram, who is the director of NOAA Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. You got to unmute yourself. There you go. Thank you, V, uh, for that very kind and generous introduction. Um, I don't think I deserve that many compliments. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'm going to okay. share, my, share your slides now. Uh, yeah, you can put up the first slide. I'll just uh, have a few comments to make at the beginning. And one of them is that uh, really a shout out and kudos to the uh, the National Society of Black Physicists. Uh, really honored to be with you all. Really delighted that you've given me this opportunity uh, on the tail of V's talk, uh, which I found to be uh, absolutely uh, delightful. Uh, this is his best talk that I've heard, uh, even better than the one that he gave uh, when, he, when he was talking about when he was uh, giving his first talk at GFTL. Um, and, and really uh, shout out to V also for describing really, you know, how one's life evolves, careers, and the career evolves, uh, you kind of uh, get into the right groove and uh, really advance uh, in terms of the uh, science that you do. So really delighted to hear that. And of course, I really enjoyed seeing his grandma with the cricket bat. Uh, no, no question about that. That was a favorite slide of mine. Um, I think we uh, described to you all uh, really very vividly how physics and mathematics uh, really plays a big role in uh, weather and climate. And, uh, you know, the slide, the first slide that, that uh, has been put up uh, essentially shows uh, on the left hand two globes. The left hand side globe is uh, depicting the weather as simulated by a numerical model, which basically takes the equations that we talked about um, and then just models the flow of uh, the fluid, in this case, the atmospheric fluid, uh, and how it kind of goes on the globe encountering mountains and then with uh, also the benefit of the air sea interactions on the right side you see currents in the ocean uh, that's actually a depiction of currents uh, it's actually supposed to be an animation but uh, i think uh, sometimes these don't work uh, on on different uh, servers and that's the other thing so atmosphere and ocean and that comes as part of uh, you know the institution i'm in national oceanic and atmospheric administration and these two are the important sort of cogs in terms of determining weather and climate, along with land and uh, the ice systems as well. Um, I, uh, let's go to the next slide, we. Um, so, you know, the, the, the really important panels are the one on the right-hand side, where it shows uh, the how physics, very traditional fundamental physics can be brought to play into applications, which lead to weather and climate uh, predictions. So, you know, this is just a very simple diagram with two sort of schematic axes, uh, Y axis being relevance for fundamental understanding, the X axis relevance for application. And, you know, traditionally there are these names given to these quadrants. Bohr's quadrant is 
very, very sort of relevant for fundamental understanding. Edison's quadrant is very relevant for application. Where we sit in NOAA research, which is research on oceans and atmospheres, is really the pasture quadrant where there's a high relevance of both fundamental knowledge and as well as its relevance for application. Very important uh, in terms of how to bring the, the sort of co the complications in physics to the reality and the practical aspects of weather and climate. Next slide. So that's what GFDL is, uh, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. And here's a sort of cartoon on the left-hand side. This is what we call the Earth system. So it consists of the atmosphere, it consists of the oceans, it consists of land, including mountains, and it consists of the ice and cryospheric system. And basically it is the confluence of the interactions between these four reservoirs, as we call it, which then gives rise to the weather and climate over different regions of the Earth. Um, and then there are two sort of uh, diagrams on the right-hand side. And the, the top right panel shows in a sort of very encapsulated fashion the interactions that you have to capture to describe the system. Now, the important thing to realize is that the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, biosphere, they all have different characteristic times, time scales. They also have uh, differing equations. They're all, they all fluids in one sense or the other, but they have differing rates, differing um, uh, governances, and they have different character characteristic time scales. So for example, the atmosphere moves very fast. The oceans move very slowly because of the nature of the fluids. But it is that interaction between a fast moving fluid and a slow moving fluid that gives rise to the va variances that you see in the weather, whether it's El Nino, La Nina, and so on. The bottom right shows what, where actually the physics and maths come in, because when you start thinking of the computational aspects, such as the diagrams that uh, we were showing, you want to consider really three axes. One is resolution, which brings in kind of how fine you can get on scales, uh, in, on space scales. Then the complexity, you got to be realistic about the model. And this is kind of where a lot of intuition, uh, physics, uh, you know, from, from very fundamental physics like spectroscopy uh, to actually uh, physics where you are studying the large scale dynamics of the of the Earth system, that comes in, and it has to be realistic because that's when that's what that's when you get to understand the system, and then simulation time. So whether it takes months to simulate or years or decades, for example, are you interested in seasonal scales, are you interested in annual scales, decadal scales, or going centennial scales, millennium scales? Uh, so this this is kind of the uh, the sort of complexity that builds in, in addition to the interactions that you have to study in the system, and some of which was manifest in uh, what V was showing uh, by way of the blocking. Uh, these are all things that you have to consider. And one thing is here is that very fundamental physics comes in here because conservation laws have to be invoked. You the, everything has to be conserved in the system. Nothing is really lost or destroyed unless as a unless as a force so under those constraints what does the weather and climate look like in terms of past weather and climate which you would need to understand in order to go and do predictions of the future so that's kind of what the the institution that uh, that i'm in and that V's in uh, we are kind of trying to tease out and piece together so sort of one really exciting thing about modeling numerical modeling is uh, it's like a twin earth. Uh, we call it digital twin. It's a twin earth. And that's because, you know, you can play around with this earth, with the modeling, modeled earth, because it's numerics. So you can ask questions like, what if? What if CO2 were increased in the atmosphere? What does the climate do? What if methane were increased? Or what if there are no mountains? Suppose the earth had no mountains. That's one of the results that we were showing. Or the earth had only oceans, which is again a calculation that we were showing. So you can pursue these. And this is kind of where uh, the intuition really plays a big part. In fact, the very first calculations of the, using such models to calculate the effect of carbon dioxide on the climate of the Earth got a Nobel Prize in, 20, in uh, uh, 2021. And the author of that, uh, the, the generator, the creator of that model was at GFTL for uh, spent a career of 40 years. But that was a question he asked. What if you increase CO2? Back then, you know, this was 1968. Nobody was asking that question, but he had this sort of intuition to ask the question and led to some interesting results. I'll end up with this slide, which is actually the left-hand slide is a kind of a trace. 
of the imbalance in the Earth's radiation budget. So the Earth, you know, gets the energy from the sun and then emits back, and it's always in balance till recently when all these things were happening in the atmosphere, emissions into the atmosphere. So the Earth has actually warmed up over the last 20 years, according to satellite measurements. And that imbalance leads to all the climate change that you see depicted as a cartoon on the right-hand side. And so I'll just leave you with this teaser question. What is the cause of the imbalance? This is a very active pursuit. Uh, and we, in fact, want to know how much, how much more imbalance there's going to be or how much less imbalance there will be if we start going to something like net zero emission, uh, net zero uh, emissions, which means that you know, you're decreasing the atmospheric composition of uh, CO2. But this is, this is the kind of problems that we are addressing right now. And uh, I'll just mention at the end that you know, one of the things that the fascination of the weather and climate modeling and predictions and understanding is that um, uh, you're dealing with uh, really, a, you're really applying physical laws to the real system, to the actual system around you. But this requires actually, you know, I mentioned intuition, but in addition to intuition, it requires really a diversity of thoughts and new ideas. And this is where I think the field is open. I mean, all of you are really kind of in your early stages of your careers. And I think this is kind of where uh, the energy is, the enthusiasm is for the pursuit of applying uh, scientific laws and scientific principles to these problems, which have a lot of societal uh, impacts, which you know is obviously of great concern. So this is a field which in intersects between you know, science and society. And that adds to the uh, sort of fascination of this field. And uh, we're trying to, we meaning the CoinCat community is trying to make this really, really more attractive and appealing to the new wave of people uh, coming in through the STEM um, the pipelines. So I'll end there and uh, back to you, V. And uh, I think it's now time for Q&A. All right, thank you. That was wonderful. So uh, I just want to say that uh, thank you very much, V, for uh, uh, the presentation, and also uh, to you, Doctor Doctor Ram. Uh, uh, I want to reiterate that we are open for questions. You can either put your questions in the chat or uh, use the Q and A feature at the panel at the bottom. Uh, but I guess to get the ball rolling, uh, I had a question myself about uh, uh, the ability uh, at like, I, I guess at like large scales to not only like use to like generate phenomenological, uh, you know, equations or uh, data, but uh, are you able to in any way uh, uh, generate equations that describe the mechanisms by which you observe like all of these uh uh yeah all of these like changes in the uh uh uh, uh atmosphere i'll let dr rom take that one he'll give you a better answer than me <laughs> uh, you go ahead you go ahead <laughs> okay um, so if if I'm getting this correctly, you're saying, are you able to write uh, equations that model the changes that you're seeing in ecosystems and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a very emerging field, right? Because this is, I mean, the first time in human history where we've cared about stuff like this and had the capabilities to actually you know, write mathematics describing it. So I would say, yeah, um, you know, we're working on it. It's a very emerging field. And there is, yeah, like in our lab, for example, there's people that are, you know, biologists by training and they're writing, you know, you know, code and solving equations that that'll tell you how much leaves are covering the earth. And that has an effect on the albedo, for example. So all of these things we kind of have to figure out mathematically, but at the same time, we have to test them because you can formulate these and you have some intuition on like, okay, it should follow some sinusoidal pattern or something, for example. But 
what it actually does in real life could be different. So we have to fit it then to observations as well. Um, maybe Dr. Ram could elaborate a, a bit more too. Yeah, one of the things I would, I'd, I'd add is that, you know, um, in, some, in some, for this case of, in the case of some processes that you know exist, it is actually difficult to frame equations because they are not necessarily, uh, the theory, underlying theory is not well settled. So uh, what to do about it? Well, this is where numerical modeling comes in because you try your different hypotheses about what that process is. Like there's something called leaf area index. Okay, that is basically the area that's covered by leaves, let's say in a forest. How do you calculate that? So there are ways where, which people have thought of, but the important thing is for all such processes, uh, you have to have observations. So one of the important things that happens is the verification of models with observations, both on the process level, as well as in the grand output, like you know the flow of the whole fluid. You know, you have observation from satellites, you have observation made from ground measurements or from aircraft. And so these are the ways you try to uh, impart some certainty into those aspects for which you may not have fully developed equations. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we have a couple of more questions. Uh, Alan Pierre Lewis asks that, uh, says that Oak Ridge National Lab's Frontier Supercomputer is the fastest in the world and is said to use its functions for climate change applications. Uh, he asks if uh, NOAA is working with Oak Ridge National Lab to use this computer. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. Um, so actually the computer that we use is resides at the Oak Ridge National Lab, but it's not the Frontier computer. So we basically, NOAA has a computer at the Oak Ridge National Lab, which we use for the research and development. Uh, we don't use a Frontier computer. Actually the Frontier computer is not yet ready for the kind of science that we do because uh, the, uh, you know, the coding that most of the codes, most of the programs that we have is still in really old Fortran. You, you won't believe it, but it's still old Fortran. And that's because it's very complicated to convert all that Fortran into the more modern architectures. That's happening though. It's happening very slowly, but the, like for example, the conversion to GPUs, uh, that is happening. So the models are not quite ready yet to run on Frontier machine, um, but they're running on, you know, as fast machines, if not frontier, slightly less faster machines. So, you know, we, we do have access uh, to them. And so we do run them on the less fast machines, uh, uh, but frontier is still some distance away, uh, some in times of time. Thank you. Uh, Elon, question, you have a question. Yes. Um... <clears throat> I actually wanted to take this opportunity to highlight one of the attendees' questions because it was my question too. But just talking about all of these computer models and simulations and things, it kind of got me thinking about this. V, if you could elaborate on like your computational background coming into this field, like you talked about your physics and your, and your math chops, we know that those are essential. Um, and now seeing they're essential to climate science is, is very interesting. But I'm curious about this question. So Jordan Newton asks, are basic skills in computer science and programming essential for a career path in meteorology and climate science or any applied academic or applied atmospheric science? So if you want to get into it, it's not essential. I mean, you, it's just something you learn along the way. I, it becomes essential once you get into it. But to be totally honest with you, before – when I got into this field, I had no idea how to code. I had no idea. I didn't even know what a terminal was, anything like that. So all it took was just me, you know, doing some tutorials and really just people sitting down with me and helping me to learn. So my PhD advisor, of course, helped me a lot. But when I, you know, did an internship at GFDL during my PhD, my guy Spencer Hill, um, Spencer Clark, he sat down with me and taught me how to use a terminal, taught me how to SSH. So it's not essential to get into it. You, Everybody has to start somewhere. It certainly helps if you have a background. So if you have an opportunity to take a you know, coding course or Python course or whatever it is, definitely take advantage of it. 
but it's yeah it's it's not a barrier to getting into it as long as you have a mind that can appreciate and understand mathematics and a curiosity and you know willingness to have fun studying nature that's you know the most important thing at the end of the day facts uh, yeah because i definitely can't code either um but i also wanted to do a follow-up question just real quick uh, how long did those simulations, I think there was like four you showed next to each other. How long did those take to generate? Oh, the simulations? Yeah, towards the um, end you showed some. So it was, yeah, it was like 50 year simulations. So, um, yeah, it wasn't really a complicated model that I was running. So, yeah, just run in a weekend. Just run it over the weekend type of oh, thing. Oh, so it does take multiple days. Yeah, it depends on how much people are also trying to run simulations, but mm. it's not that bad, like, you know. And how many computers did you use for that, like, uh, cores? Well, well, there's, like, a supercomputing cluster that we have access to, so I don't know how much cores it uses, but, you know, we just log in and submit our thing, and it it runs it, yeah. Ah, so it runs based off the size of it. Interesting. All right, I'll, I'll let somebody else ask. Thank you for the uh... answer. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you for the additional question, Elon. Uh, we have uh, a question from Jordan Newton, who asks, oh, wait, that was the last question, so I'll close that one. Uh, we have a question from Alan, again, uh, who asks, uh, how much are Markov chain, sorry, how much are Markov chains or Markov uh, Monte Carlo used in your models? Uh, he says that he knows that weighted Markov chains can be used for weather patterns in ecological models. Uh, but yeah. Uh huh. So um, yeah, maybe Dr. Ron can talk a little bit more about this. There's also a question about the African continent. I think we should cover and the Caribbean. But um, I would just say, um, yeah, for my work in particular, it's not. It, the, I'm using the Monte Carlo more for like statistical analysis, so like significance testing, that kind of thing. I know probably in AI applications to climate modeling, people are using these kinds of um, Monte Carlo kind of random approaches. But yeah, Dr. Ram, do you have any insight on that? Markov chains and utilization in our field? Um, yeah, so uh, yes, I mean, Markov chain, uh, the whole the theories are used. But mostly in a diagnostic sense, like you know, when you're analyzing uh, the results from model, then you want to, when you're asking questions, of, let's say, uh, is there an attractor to which you know the simulations are going, or is there linearity in them? So such questions are, you know, basically this what you are simulating through computational uh, science is a very complicated flow situation, and the question you ask in a diagnosis is. How can you interpret it? Uh, so are the flows tending towards a particular blocking situation? So those then, you know, the, the Markov theories actually come into play to analyze or to give an interpretation uh, to the results. Okay. And uh, V, you said you wanted to cover uh, the uh, question on African uh, continent and Caribbean geophysics. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, um, Alan said, I tend to see a strong emphasis in geophysics on African and the Caribbean um, in terms of people majoring in those fields and being professors, but these areas do not have the same access to such computational facilities as the U.S. So does NOAA do research in such places too? So Dr. Rahm, he, he – um, gave an answer. He said NOAA does have collaborative research partnerships with various countries around the globe. So it's important to note that there, these partnerships exist out there. But I think also that there's a lot of opportunity that needs to be explored. Um, I've been talking with a Jamaican atmospheric physicist that I met a few weeks ago, actually. You know, the first time I've ever met someone, the second time I've ever met another Caribbean person studying atmospheric science. And we were like, you know, let's start a, you know, Caribbeans and climate group. So the goal of that group, for example, is to, part of it is to connect Caribbean people, people actually in the Caribbean with the scientific community over here. Because I also find it very problematic that you have, you know, prestigious institutions and people that are profiting and making careers out of studying the Caribbean 
for example, but not really, you know, with too much interest in the actual Caribbean people themselves. So I think it's important that as scientists here, we are afforded a lot of privilege to even just be and conduct our science here. But it's very important that we reach out, you know, at conferences, you know, sending cold emails to institutions. University of West Indies, for example, is a really good one. And, and trying to partner and collaborate with these people because we're studying exactly what they're studying and, you know, they are the ones living it, you know? Okay. Uh, I think we're coming up on times. Uh, so if there are any last minute questions, I might just ask like one really short one uh, selfishly. Uh, I guess, uh, where, what would you like to see, uh, I guess, either method-wise or uh, equipment-wise in climate science? So, you know, machine learning is all of the rage in, like, multiple fields. Uh, astronomy just had, like, their golden child with the James Webb Telescope. I, I guess I'm curious what big thing would you like to see happen in climate science uh, in the near future? I'll answer it really quickly so then Dr. Ram can chime in. But um, the other day we had Nobel Prize winner Suki Manabe who worked at the lab for 40 years and did his Nobel Prize winning work there. He gave us a fireside chat and his whole thing was, you know, let's have some fun. Let's just keep increasing the resolution of the model. So what I was showing you was 100 kilometer resolution. I was making calculations. Well, let's go higher. Let's go 20 kilometers, 10 kilometers, five kilometers. But when you go to those those high resolution um, models, it's a very, very expensive calculation and it's tremendous amount of data that you have to process. So I would like to see, you know, computing get better to be able to to handle that and, and move through it efficiently. Dr. Ron? Yeah, so I, I'll just sort of follow up on that and say that for, you know, uh, we mentioned Suki Manabi. I mean, for this lab has been there since 1955 and for, forever since then, the, the mantra has been brainware and hardware are almost in equal proportion. Mm -hmm. So the hardware part would be high performance computing that we need to sort of really keep up with it, like someone mentioned, the frontier machine, we have to keep going on that uh, on that line because society is asking very very intricate and difficult questions about climate change and climate variation. So that's on the hardware side. The brainware side, curiosity. I mean, nothing really drives anything like that. It's the what if questions. What what if you increase resolution? What if you change this? What if you change that? That curiosity always has to be, I think, driving a driving force and that's kind of where human beings come in to kind of ask those what if questions so the combination of brain well and hardware is really what would be making this field go forward thank you thank you for that question thank you uh with that being said i think the q a section can be closed and i'll hand it over to elon to close this out all righty so i would just like to thank our speakers again dr v dr ramaswamy I appreciate you coming out today and telling us all about climate science and atmospheric physics. I mean, it's not something that we're very um, that I'm very familiar with. It sounds like it's a very novel field, but after this talk, I'm like super interested. So I'm sure that this will be very impactful, especially if you're watching this recording. We have all of the resources here. Rewind and get those resources if you want to break into this field. Um, so thank you everybody for logging on today and I hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday. All right. Thank, thank you. you.